So um, I'm uh, Robert Sherbakov, so I'm associate cross appointed with the Department of Physics and Astronomy. And I'm going to talk uh, more about the application of the, or trying to explain earthquakes in terms of uh, complex systems and with some uh, more applied sort of uh, formulation of this forecasting of earthquakes. And then so that means how we can basically forecast behavior of uh, complex systems from statistics point of view, from physics point of view. And um, so here's, my outline of the talk. So going, I'm going to uh, talk here about the um, uh, earthquakes as a complex system. So that means I'll try to show some features of earthquakes which qualify to be a complex system. Then I'm going to contrast this uh, uh, forecasting versus prediction. Sometimes those two terms are confused, but we can uh, be more careful in terms of what we're forecasting than what we're predicting. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the modeling. So that means how we can model earthquakes, say how can we model earthquakes behavior in time or in magnitude or in space. And of course, when we're doing modeling, we always have uncertainties related to the models. And so how we can take those uncertainties in our basically analysis or how we can incorporate them. And then, then I'm going to demonstrate specifically uh, how we can formulate that problem of forecasting in case of the earthquakes. And uh, then I'll uh, show also some results of our the application of that Bayesian approach to try to uh, basically formulate the way how can we compute the probabilities for the occurrence of earthquakes. And then I'll uh, show that application to one particular earthquake sequence in California, and then how our approach sort of allowed us to compute the probabilities for the occurrence of earthquakes during evolution of that sequence. So earthquakes uh, usually occur in this upper brittle layer of the Earth's crust, and they are a result of instabilities generated by moving tectonic plates. And this constant driving assisted by the convective movement of the mantle supplies the energy into that system. So it means typically that system is out of equilibrium. So there is this input of uh, energy into the system, and then there is output due to the occurrence of uh, earthquakes. And this state is reached through the processes of self-organization, and it's characterized by long-range temporal and spatial correlations and scale invariant uh, behavior. So in this respect, the earthquakes, they conform to many of those uh, definitions of complex systems. So those main ingredients which we observe in complex systems, they can be also uh, seen in case of the earthquakes. Here in this uh, uh, short video, Do you still hear me? Yep. Oh, okay, great. I, I got some pop-up message that Zoom got disconnected. <laughs> okay, great. So here I, I'm showing this um, evolution, say, of earthquakes um, in uh, California from 1990 to uh, 2017 or 2019 even. So just showing how earthquakes uh, sort of occur and uh, the sizes of those uh, disks indicates the basically the size of the earthquake. So that means we can see you can have large earthquakes, small earthquakes, intermediate earthquakes. And of course, they don't occur fully randomly. So there are some sort of uh, locations where more earthquakes occur, and typically that associated with presence of faults, because typically earthquakes occur on those fractures, basically, inside uh, crust. And of course, in earthquakes also interact with each other. So it means they can trigger other earthquakes and so it means they can uh, change the stresses or forces acting around them, and then that can result in more earthquakes. So it's to some extent, earthquakes, they follow this uh, cascade type of uh, behavior. So it means some earthquakes can trigger more earthquakes and so forth. Earthquake systems operate at different time scales and involve interaction among various constituent parts through physical, chemical, and rheological processes. And the emergence of such complex behavior is a direct result of nonlinear threshold dynamics at the dissipative and the dissipative nature of earthquake systems. And that's why uh, typically what we observe in case of the uh, complex system, this nonlinearity, long range spatial and temporal correlations, effects of memory and feedback mechanisms, they lead to the multiplicity of states and strong sensitivity to initial conditions. So those all major, these kind of features which we have in case of the complex systems are also observed 
in case of the uh, uh, earthquakes. Now, in uh, 2016, uh, uh, Scientific American asked this leading scientist 20 big questions about the future of humanity. And one of the questions was, do you think that we'll be able one day to predict, say, natural disasters such as earthquakes with warning times of days or hours? Of course, pretty ambitious questions and a very challenging one. So in terms of like uh, studies of, uh, in general, of uh, complex systems or, say, natural systems or hazards, one is interesting in, in forecasting the future behavior of these systems, because it's not only interesting or important to analyze, say, the past behavior and try to infer some important characteristics of those systems, but it's also really important just to see how we can we forecast basically forward in time and say, can we basically forecast the evolution of those complex systems and specifically, say, the uh, occurrence of earthquakes. But here we can distinguish between, say, prediction and forecasting. So in case of the forecasting, it's basically we're computing the probabilities for the occurrence of certain events. Or this is also similar, say, in case of the weather forecasting. Typically, in case of the weather forecasts, so we can uh, have like a, a probabilities of having uh, rain tomorrow. Say there's 50% chance of having rain tomorrow for the next several days. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, prediction, it's providing a very narrow range of temporal spatial magnitude ranges for the occurrence of events. So that means the prediction means as it's almost like forecasting with 100%. That means can we basically provide very narrow range of time interval or just area and also magnitude range where say the next earthquake is going to occur. Unfortunately, prediction at the moment is not possible, uh, at least for earthquakes, but we can do forecasting. So it means the forecasting is still possible. Although for some uh, forecasts, the probabilities can be pretty low but it's still a forecast. So here's an example of uh, 2011 magnitude 9 uh, Tohoku earthquake, basically aftermath of, uh, of that, after that earthquake, sort of devastation uh, from that earthquake and specifically from the tsunami which that earthquake generated. At least 15,000 people were killed and the total economic loss was estimated at $3.9 billion. So it was devastating effect, one of the largest earthquakes which occurred in the last uh, uh, 10 years or so. So that means it's really important that if we can uh, forecast the occurrence of such a large event, or at least can we do uh, even forecast the occurrence of the earthquakes which follow those large uh, earthquakes, which we know uh, we call them aftershocks. So those are important questions to address and uh, to formulate and maybe to provide those methods how we can do that. In terms of the modeling and, uh, say, associated uncertainties, in some cases, natural stochastic systems can be described by specific stochastic models or processes. And these models are developed based on the fundamental aspects of the occurrence of natural hazards and empirical observations. However, this also results in various sources of model uncertainties. So that means when we model uh, those systems, we have to deal with uh, uncertainties associated with the modeling process, with assumptions we introduce into the systems. And so the modeling and forecasting have to take properly into account those uncertainties. So it means when we're computing those probabilities, we have to know how to incorporate those uncertainties because they can significantly affect uh, those probabilities. Typically, like in uh, statistics, in natural sciences, we, we are talking about this epi epistemic uncertainties and they uh, characterize all reducible uncertainties arising from the limited knowledge about the natural processes. And typically in Bayesian say analysis, that can be incorporated into prior information. And then we also have aleatory type of uncertainties and then they describe the intrinsic irreducible variability of the stochastic process itself. And that also is sort of present in our formulation of the rate model, say frequency magnitude statistics of earthquakes and so forth. It's turned out that the Bayesian approach allows to incorporate both types of those uncertainties in, in the analysis and provide uh, reasonable sort of uh, calculations when we incorporate those uh, uncertainties. So let's I'll, a little bit uh, boom, be more specific in terms of the earthquakes. And here I'll sort of formulate that uh, forecasting basic problem in case of the earthquakes. So that means typically we observe, say, earthquake during the training time interval. So that means it can be like a our past. So that means we can record the times of the occurrence of those earthquakes. We also can have, say, the 
uh, sizes or magnitudes of those earthquakes. And we can use that information and say what we can tell from that training time interval if we look into the future and say during this delta t forecasting time interval. So say, can we uh, compute the probability for the occurrence, say, of the largest event during that forecasting time interval? So typically, that forecasting time interval can be like several days, maybe a week. It can be a month, or even you can have long time, term type of forecasting. But today, I'll concentrate mostly on short term forecasting. So that means if we observe some previous events, and then if we compute the sort of probabilities for the occurrence of the uh, those largest say events uh, in during the next say seven days or so. So that's why a problem of constraining the magnitude of the largest say expected earthquake during a future time interval. So that means this is what uh, I'm addressing here. And for this problem, one is interested in computing the distribution for the largest that expected earthquake in the that during that forecasting time interval and to be for that largest expected earthquake to be greater than uh, given m. So that means basically we want to compute this so-called probability density function. And if we'll be able to compute that, then we can basically estimate those probabilities. So here's I'll show the illustration of that method and what we developed in application to one this particular earthquake se sequence in California. So uh, it happened in July uh, 2019. So that sequence started from uh, occurrence of some small events and then a relatively large event of magnitude 6.4 occurred on uh, July 4th. And then after that, it generated uh, smaller events. And then those are sort of so-called aftershocks of that first event. But then uh, less than two days after that, even stronger earthquake happened of that magnitude 7.1 and it generated its own aftershock sequence. So that was pretty interesting, this kind of complex uh, sequence itself. And so here's just that evolution of that sequence in time. So the, the, there were some uh, smaller events before that magnitude 6.4, then that magnitude 6.4 earthquake happened, smaller events start to occur after that, and then even larger event uh, occurred, that magnitude 7.1 event, and then those aftershocks or just uh, subsequent earthquakes start to appear later in time after that sequence. And of course, uh, now to uh, model that system, we need to uh, use some models. So it means, and because we, in typically natural sciences, we use math, uh, statistics, physics. So it means we, we need to formulate some uh, model which can say describe the earthquake occurrence rate. Yeah? And in this case, uh, in most cases, we're assuming that the earthquake uh, occurrence, uh, it can be envisioned as a cascade of triggered events with scale invariant features. And to describe this type of process, we can use so-called uh, epidemic type aftershock sequence model. It's a doubly stochastic mark point process. But basically, this equation incorporates the rate of occurrence of events. So that means, let's say, at given time t, what is the average, say, number of events per unit time we can observe? Yeah. And of course, uh, here, it, that uh, model has two uh, major sort of components. One is incorporated in that uh, variable mu, or is it even it's even constant. So that assumes that that rate sort of uh, due to that mu constant basically assumes that earthquakes are popping randomly with a certain rate. And this is what's known as a Poisson process. And so that uh, comes uh, and is controlled by that mu parameter, basically. And the second part, it assumes that each earthquake in the past can trigger subsequent earthquakes. And that's why, uh, total rate of earthquakes which we observe, it's a combined effect of that background rate and also the contribution from, from all previous earthquakes which already occurred, including those background events, because they can trigger more earthquakes and then they can elevate the uh, rate. So that means this model, it basically, that's why it's called also epidemic because it has many similarities with say the uh, spread of uh, epidemics, so even the COVID, basically, in some way, it can be described in similar sort of uh, process. So that describes the rate. And here's the specific fit of that uh, rate to observe our uh, earthquake sequence. So that means that red uh, solid line basically describes how the earthquakes uh, per unit uh, time occurring during the evolution of that uh, sequence. And so actual earthquakes, those um, uh, symbols with uh, stamps, they, those are magnitudes of actual earthquakes which occurred during that evolution of that sequence. Another important aspect of the uh, sort of uh, 
characterizing earthquakes is to see how the sizes of earthquakes are distributed. And then for this purpose, we can use say that uh, left truncated exponential distribution where M is a magnitude basically, which describes the sizes of earthquakes and that basically exponential distribution describes how the magnitudes are distributed. In statistical uh, sort of seismology, we use also this Gutenberg for scaling, but this is basically uh, same as uh, exponential distribution. So that it means that cumulative number of earthquakes above certain magnitude is or logarithm of that number is simply follows a straight line. And so if we apply that uh, to our case, so for the sequence, so we can see that earthquakes, at least in that range, starting from 3.2 magnitude up to uh, largest one, more or less, they follow that uh, empirical sort of uh, law. Uh, and uh, here's just the, those parameters, the B values, which describe basically the slope. And it's turned out that the B values are pretty universal and they typically around one. They can vary slightly, but typically around one for many type of sort of uh, earthquakes worldwide, basically. And why it's interesting, because magnitude, which is used to describe the size of the earthquakes, it's a, basically it's a logarithm of the energy. And so if one writes the, basically the rate of the occurrence of the um, uh, events or just distribution of number of events versus energy, it, uh, it's possible to obtain this uh, power law distribution. So that means the earthquake, uh, earthquakes are distributed as a fractal, basically, or just scale invariant type of uh, sort of uh, uh, phenomenon. And uh, it's another sort of signature of uh, complex uh, systems. Now, in terms of uh, forecasting, going back, now we have our model. So that means we have the model which describes our rate of the occurrence and say this ITAS model, it, it has uh, five parameters here. And of course we have this frequency magnitude statistics. It has uh, one extra parameter beta. And now we can uh, estimate those parameters, but it's also important to properly estimate the basically uncertainties of those parameters. And this can be done through Bayesian analysis. And then here uh, I, I write this sort of in symbolic form, so-called uh, posterior distribution for the model parameters. So that means if we know the, uh, magnitudes and times of the occurrence of those events. So that means if we have that information, we can compute through this uh, Bayesian framework uh, using the likelihood function and also the prior distribution of those model parameters. We can compute the distribution of the model parameters, not simply the specific uh, values of those model parameters, but full sort of distribution containing all their uncertainties. And finally, we uh, incorporated that Bayesian uh, predictive distribution also with uh, so-called extreme value distribution for the uh, distribution of those extreme events. And we computed this uh, Bayesian predictive distribution basically sort of that gives what is the probability of having those extreme earthquakes above certain magnitude given the past seismicity uh, rate and also specifying the future uh, time interval. Of course, computation of that Bayesian predictive distribution is not so simple. So it's because it's a multidimensional parameter space so that it in this particular case, it has six parameters. So that means the integrals are six dimensional. So that means computing those integrals are not uh, trivial. And also the stochastic nature of the ETAS process uh, contains a lot of uncertainties and so forth. And uh, so it means the Bayesian predictive distribution can be computed by uh, Marco chain Monte Carlo sampling of the posterior distribution and using the Metropolis within Gibbs uh, algorithm. And then this was published in Nature Communication in several years ago in that paper. So here's an example of the say sampling of the model parameters uh, using the Mar Marco chain Monte Carlo sampling of the uh, of those model parameters. This is the basically marginal distribution of those uh, model parameters, and those distribution basically contain the uncertainties associated with each uh, model parameter. And so, in terms of now computing that Bayesian predictive distribution, this is like this kind of uh, algorithm, how we do that. So that means we first sample the posterior distribution and generate a uh, Markov chain sequence of the model parameters. And then using each sample of that it has parameter, we generate stochastic sequence of earthquakes during that forecasting time interval. Then we extract say the maximum magnitude event from each sequence. And then this distribution of the maximum magnitudes will approximate the, that Bayesian predictive uh, distribution. This is the basically algorithm, how we apply that technique. And so here's one example, so that means that solid uh, red line indicates that computation of that Bayesian predictive distribution. 
and say if we pick, uh, so here it's, I used um, uh, 2.4 basically days of the training time interval and the forecasting time interval is seven days. And say, uh, if I want now from this uh, red uh, solid curve to compute that basically that probability, say what is the probability to have earthquakes above uh, uh, 6.1, uh, so that will give me 14%. Uh, so it means I'm forecasting that with 14%, there is a chance of uh, an earthquake above magnitude 6.1. And um, now the, uh, here, just that application of that method to the, through the whole sequence. So that means here I'm illustrating how those uh, probabilities were computed during the evolution of the sequence. And so that means, let's say, uh, if uh, that, uh, that curve, that light blue curve illustrates what is the probability of having earthquakes, those extreme earthquakes during magnitude 4.5 during evolution of that sequence. Of course, it's, uh, that uh, probability is really large, uh, very close to the occurrence of those large events, but then it decays in time. And of course, if we're considering really uh, large events, say magnitude 7.1, then those probabilities are typically very small. So it means here, uh, say before the occurrence of that large uh, 7.1 event, the probability was 0.5%. Then it increased after the occurrence of the large event, and then it will start decaying further in time the sequence was evolving. And of course, uh, in all this uh, uh, sort of I illustrated the application of that forecasting approach and uh, computing the probabilities, but it's, it's also important um, uh, not simply just compute the probabilities and uh, compute other sort of quantities of interest, but it's also poss possible or important to test basically those forecasts to see how well basically we are doing when we're performing those uh, forecasts. And it's turned out that in, say, in um, uh, geophysics communities, specifically uh, in uh, those areas where we study earthquakes, so uh, they developed specific tests, basically statistical tests to assess our forecasts. And then there are so-called M, M, R, T tests and say one also can compute so-called Bayesian p-value and so forth. So that means it's possible basically to test our uh, forecasts. And then here I'm illustrating application of that M test, basically uh, M tests, uh, uh, tests uh, to what extent we can forecast the occurrence of the number of events during the each forecasting time interval above certain magnitude. And here it's example of, again, of that rich crest sequence um, in California. So that uh, black symbol indicates actually observed number of earthquakes during those uh, uh, forecasted, forecasted time intervals. This is basically retrospective type of analysis. And you can see that uh, basically the ETAS model uh, describes that uh, numbers pretty well. And so it means we can use uh, ETAS model the way how we formulate it with uh, all these uncertainties incorporated in the analysis. And it's turned out that the ETAS model performs really well in terms of the forecasting the number of events. But it's all, not only a uh, number of events, but the and magnitude and some other sort of characteristics what sort of uh, that our proposed approach uh, forecasted, uh, they, they uh, sort of results pass uh, pretty well the tests. So in conclusion, so I sort of gave this kind of overview and some sort of indications that observations and uh, modeling indicate that earthquakes are, are an example of a complex system. And here I also presented this approach based on the Bayesian methods and extreme value theory, uh, sort of to forecast the magnitude of the largest expected earthquakes to occur during a specified future time interval. And I illustrated that application uh, when uh, using that specific uh, rich crest uh, sequence in uh, California. So thank you. So uh, I'm happy to answer your questions.